In this video, we're gonna talk about why nodes exist and why we need them, we'll take a look at the anatomy of a node, and we're gonna talk about the thought process and the strategy that went into making this animation. The idea is that you walk out of this video with a solid foundation to begin your Geometry Nodes journey. I'm Dude Blender, and let's jump right in. So let's start with why. Why do we need nodes when we have so many other tools in Blender? Let me give you four reasons. 1. To be able to modify the geometry of an object in non-destructive steps. Let's say that you model this figure using traditional methods. Later in the process, you realize that you need a higher resolution, more panels in the sphere and uh-oh, spaghettios, you can't. You would need to start with a new sphere. In geometry nodes, you can change any step at any point in the process. 2. To work with multiple instances of an object. Take this animation that we'll review later on. With traditional animation methods, it would be almost impossible to animate everything. Each object has a unique animation. With geometry nodes, we can just set the rules and let Blender do the heavy lifting. 3. It's a relatively easy way to make complex processes. And think about it, if we didn't have access to geometry nodes, how would you approach an animation like this? The only way that I can think of is coding, and I would say that's even harder than learning nodes. Four, you can easily reuse your work. So if I have this effect and then want to apply it to a different shape, I just add the node tree, adjust some of its parameters, and that's all we need to do. Nodes strike a balance between complexity and usability. That's why you see them in software like DaVinci Resolve Fusion or Houdini, as well as in Blender Shader or in the Compositor. So what actually is a node? I would define this as a visual representation of a specific function or piece of information that plays a role within a larger system. Think of them as music notes. You've got seven notes plus five flats and sharps, and depending on how you arrange those notes, you can make an infinite number of melodies. Notes are the same. With a limited number of them, you can create an infinite number of results, depending on which ones you use and how you arrange them. A note has, first of all, a core functionality, the way it actually processes the inputs to generate outputs. Things like adding two numbers, subdividing a mesh, providing information about an object, or calculating the distance between two elements. Visually, it has a header that is color-coded by category. The colors can be changed in the preferences, but these are the default colors. The most common that you'll see are dark blue, which are nodes that have to do with attributes, wine or pale red, which are input nodes, usually information or constant values, aqua, which are nodes that have to do with creating or modifying geometry, orange, which are texture nodes, and light blue, converters, such as math operation, random values, clamps or switches. Of course, we also have the group input and group output, which are dark gray. Nodes also have input and output sockets. They are color-coded based on the type of data that they are associated with as per this table. I made a video that talks specifically about color sockets and shapes, if you want to check that out after this video. According to this Reddit post, there were over 450 geometry nodes in Blender 3.5, and there are probably more now. Of course, the more nodes that you have in your repertoire, the more things you'll be able to do. However, Depending on what type of project you specialize on, you'll only need to know a fraction of those and many of them are very very similar. Whenever you add a node tree to an object, you'll automatically create a new tree and assign that tree to a geometry nodes modifier. This works like any other modifier. You can apply and hard set the modified geometry and you can also turn it on and off with these buttons. Here you can assign any node group that you've created in the scene. And as mentioned before, it also stacks and works with other modifiers. Modifiers. Okay, now let's see how they work. I like using the Geometry Nodes workspace since it has all the panels that we need. I'm going to add an icosphere, delete this, and the way we add a node tree is by clicking on this button. I do suggest that you make a habit of naming your tree. I'm gonna name this test. This region is the Geometry Nodes editor, and we still have a 3D viewport to see what we're doing. The spreadsheet is useful in some projects where you want to be able to see this information, although for most projects you can ignore it or just close it. You'll start with group in input and output nodes by default. The input contains the original geometry that you start with. Just remember that if there are other modifiers within your stack, this geometry will change depending on where the geometry nodes modifier is in your stack. Whatever is connected to the group output will be your modified geometry. This is always the end of your tree. I'm going to add an extrude mesh node and plug it here. Nodes work from left 
to write, meaning that the output of the group input node is the input of the next node in the tree. If I add a delete geometry node next and plug it here, it deletes everything. To add nodes, you press Shift A and the menu with all of the nodes will pop up. When you start using geometry nodes, you'll be using the sub menus. Once you have a little bit of experience, you'll usually know the name of the node and you can just start typing it. However, sometimes you don't know what nodes exist for a specific task. Let's say I wanted to add a primitive, something like a plane. If I look for plane, you'll see that it doesn't exist. So in those cases, you want to go to mesh primitives and see what they have. You'll see that there is no plane, but there's a grid, so you would use that. Back to our tree, you'll see that the geometry has been deleted. The extruded geometry works as an input to the delete geometry node, which does precisely that, and it outputs an empty geometry because everything has been deleted. You'll see that the extrude mesh node conveniently has these two sockets, top and side. These are boolean outputs that contain the corresponding selection, and then the delete geometry node has conveniently a selection input so I can connect any of these outputs to this input. I just want to delete the sides of the extruded geometry so I can connect this here. It's still deleting everything but that's because this property is set to points so it's deleting the vertices. If I change that to face now it's only deleting the side faces of the extruded geometry. It's a sequence of steps one after another but where all steps are accessible at any point. So if I wanted to change the offset of the extrusion, I can do it now and it doesn't affect anything else. In fact, if I wanted, I could go all the way to the very first step, the original geometry, and change that without affecting the nodes that follow. Let's say I wanted a UV sphere instead. I could add a UV sphere primitive right here from the geometry nodes and connect that to the extrude mesh input. You can see how powerful this workflow is. So I can change my mind at any point during the process and change that specific node without having to do all all of the work again. So that's the basic theory. So now let's take a look at this tree that makes this animation. The basic idea with geometry nodes is to divide and conquer. Make your objective very clear, then formulate a strategy to get there and choose the tools that will take you one step at a time to that objective. So in this example the objective is to have a brick road that builds itself as the camera approaches. My strategy to achieve this is to have a grid of bricks and then give each brick a secondary random position and rotation and then just gradually change between the two positions as the camera approaches. This is the final tree and there are a few talking points that I want to address. First, following a few tutorials and experimenting is important to start getting an idea of what nodes are available to you and how to use them. You need to have some basic knowledge before you can start designing the strategy. Second, I arranged this into groups of nodes to show you that no matter how complex a tree is, everything is built the same way. A big objective broken down into smaller tasks that can in turn be accomplished by nodes. For example, we have the grid that will provide the organized position of the bricks. Then here we have these nodes that make the shapes of the bricks. A cube with these dimensions and a subdivision surface node to make the bricks look rounder. These nodes instance the bricks and set the material. This and this node provide the randomness of the rotation and the position. Then that randomness is controlled controlled by these nodes depending on the distance between each point and the reference. The reference is this empty. I didn't use the camera directly as a reference because this way I can just change the position of the camera to get exactly what I want. So the camera is parented to the empty and then I can just move the empty. The information of this empty is in this node. You'll see that I colored some of my groups of nodes with an orange frame. This is to indicate to me that these nodes have controls that I can change. For example here I used a map range node to control the minimum distance between the bricks and the empty where they will start reacting. I can also control the maximum distance where the bricks will start to react. One more thing that you'll encounter over and over and over again. Once you've designed your strategy of how to approach the problem and implement that strategy, you might find errors that you didn't foresee when you were designing that strategy. I want to give you an example. I'm just going to connect this here. So I'm just ignoring all of these nodes. What I saw is that with my strategy, if I start animating this, you'll see that bricks overlap each other and it happens very often. At the last frame you can see here is another one. And the reason is that the positions were completely random. So for example, the random position of this brick could be over here and the random position of this one could be over here. So they would just crisscross applesauce and that created these ugly overlaps. So I didn't foresee that this could be an issue, so my strategy didn't consider it. 
great. And at this point, you have to be brutally honest with yourself, especially if you're doing client work, and see if this is acceptable or not. And what I mean by that is that if we continue to spend more time in this project, you'll either make this more expensive to your client because you're taking longer and you have to charge for those hours, or you're lowering your hourly rate because you will take longer and not charge extra. For me, this is too obvious. So I thought, I'm going to fix it. I'm not going to change my whole strategy. I'm just going to add a fix. So what I'm doing here is, so if the brick is closer to the right, move it to the right. And if it's closer to the left, move it to the left. Now, if I show you the animation again, you'll see that it does in fact reduce the overlap. They still do happen. But at this point, what I think is there are so many things happening. So many elements are moving and people are not going to be watching this animation frame by frame to see if I made any mistake. So at this point, I say, this is good enough. I don't need to go back and do everything else all over again. The final point that I want to make here is here we're using 19 different notes. 17 if you count the different math notes as the same one. I use these notes all the time. Literally with a 20 note repertoire you can do a bunch of things and then you can start incorporating new nodes and exploring but I can tell you that primitives, cube, grid, cylinder, etc. Instance and points, set material, set position, random value, map range, object info, position, maybe also the noise texture and color ramp are the base of every project that I make. So don't feel like you have to know every node. Start doing a few projects that build on what you like to do and then expand your knowledge from there. If you want to continue watching, your first five nodes or master of sockets are great follow-ups to this video. I'm Dude Blender. Happy blending.